From Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus with Paul Salem. Welcome to Middle East Focus. I'm Alistair Taylor, MEI's editorial director, and I'm filling in for Paul again this week. Today we're going to be talking about the situation in Gaza, and we'll be covering the recent flare-up in violence, subsequent ceasefire, and where things go from here. I'm joined today by two excellent guests, Elizabeth Campbell and Nathan Stock. Elizabeth is the director of UNRWA's representative office here in Washington and was previously the senior humanitarian policy advisor in the Bureau of International Organization Affairs, the State Department. Nathan is a non-resident scholar here at MEI who writes about Israeli-Palestinian affairs regularly. He was previously the director of the Carter Center's Israel-Palestine field office. Elizabeth, let's start with you. Uh, Can you give us a sense of what the situation in Gaza is like at the moment? Sure. Well, really, for the past several months, um, it's been an extremely tense and, frankly, deadly uh, place to live. And UNRWA, of course, is one of the central institutional pillars in Gaza. We provide services, namely education, health care, and humanitarian assistance, to two-thirds of the total population. As you may know, the U.S. government decided for the first time in 70 years to cut its funding to UNRWA this year, um, very unexpectedly. So that has led to an extraordinary sense of instability, insecurity, on top of an already um, exploding, devastating uh, humanitarian crisis. So really what we've seen um, in the last several months, not least, of course, what's happened over the past couple of weeks, is uh, growing insecurity, instability, a real sense of despair among the average uh, families who live there um, in the context of a horrific uh, humanitarian crisis. So I can't overstate sort of the sense of uh, desperation um, that your average uh, civilian and family uh, member is is feeling in Gaza. Just to kind of uh, continue in, in, in that, Van, I know the, the IMF recently described the, the economic situation in Gaza as increasingly untenable. This is language that they've been using for, for a long time now. But uh, according to statistics, the unemployment rate and the poverty rate are now both above 50 percent in Gaza. Um, can you just maybe speak a little bit more about how much worse things have gotten in the last few years? I think, as you know, as uh, most of your listeners are well aware, Palestinians living in Gaza are are basically uh, not able <laughs> to to leave or to move back and forth, um, and it basically stifles any ability for them to be self-sufficient and to improve their economic uh, conditions. So we have just a constant steady deterioration, including especially among uh, the youth, uh, where the unemployment rate has continues to absolutely skyrocket. Um, Sadly, in many ways, UNRWA is the second largest employer in Gaza, employing around 13,000 individuals. And so families rely um, enormously uh, on us and that the small in- income that we provide for them. Today, um, about 98% of the population inside of Gaza has never left. Um, so the economic uh, prospects for new graduates, for those who have skills and are able to make meaningful contributions, uh, are dismal. Um, and it, again, just continues to decline. Elizabeth, I wanted to ask you about uh, uh, UNRWA specifically as well. You touched on this in your kind of opening comments, but uh, I think it's fair to say that 2018 has been a pretty difficult year for you guys. Um, The U.S. has historically been your single largest donor, providing around $350 million a year in funding. Uh, as you mentioned, in the uh, the administration in January announced that it would be reducing that, and then in August said it would it would be cutting that altogether. Um, where do things stand now on that front? Have you been able to make up that shortfall, and what impact has this had on your ability to uh, to deliver services, particularly in Gaza? Thanks for that question. Um, it's been an absolutely um, a difficult year for us. It was very unexpected um, when the U.S. decided in January to freeze its expected contribution. Our boss had been in Washington um, speaking with high-level officials, and the message in late last year was, you know, UNRWA is doing great work. We had completed our framework agreement with the State Department, and uh, we're basically expecting the funding. We were simply not prepared to try to climb out of the deficit of $300 million that the U.S. um, um, brought to our operations. It absolutely impacted Gaza, including especially in the form of food assistance. 
UNRWA provides half the population food assistance in Gaza. That's over 1 million individuals. And we had procured the food with the expectation that U.S. funding would be forthcoming in January um, for the first quarter. And that funding never came. And so right away from the beginning, we were um, in a deficit, $45 million uh, as a result of that. So when the U.S. decided to freeze its funding, it just created enormous instability. It was really an existential threat to our agency. Never before had we ever faced in the 70 years of our operation that type of financial challenge. And right away, our commissioner general was very clear. We had no choice but to dig deep and to find a way forward because at risk was something extraordinary, right? 525,000 boys and girls depend on UNRWA for education. Over 3 million individuals depend on UNRWA's health clinics to access primary health care. And more than 1.7 million people depend on UNRWA for food and cash assistance. And so early on in the year, we met and developed a strategy of outreach. And slowly but surely, um, throughout this year, including at various meetings um, that the UN and the Secretary General and other member states uh, co-hosted, we've been able to steadily reduce that enormous deficit. And as of this week, I'm proud to say that our deficit, which started at $446 million in January, is now down to $21 million. And that, I think, for us is just an extraordinary feat. And really what that means is that the international community has decided that UNRWA remains a vital pillar of stability across the Middle East, including especially in Gaza, that it must be preserved, that it is essential, and that by not funding us, you are essentially adding to the de-development of the Middle East. So we are very close to finishing or closing the remaining um, gap and expect that we will be able to do so by the end of this year. Well, that's that's great to hear. Um, shifting gears a little bit, moving over to you, Nathan, I wanted to ask about kind of the events of the last few weeks, specifically the the fighting that broke out uh, last week in Gaza on, on the Sunday night um, following a, a botched Israeli covert operation. What happened there? Why were both sides so quick to agree to a ceasefire? And given the kind of seeming similarities between what we saw back in July 2014, why was the outcome so different this time around? Thanks, Alistair. So uh, in the early morning hours of the 12th, um, an Israeli military team was discovered several kilometers inside the Gaza Strip by a, a local Hamas uh, Qassam Brigade commander. Uh, when they were found out, a firefight ensued. Seven Palestinians and, and one senior Israeli officer were killed. Uh, and in the aftermath of the fighting, uh, Palestinian militant groups launched some 460 rockets and mortars toward Israel. Israel hit 160 targets in the Gaza Strip over the course of the next 48 hours. But by the evening of the 13th, uh, the uh, Joint Operations Room of, of Palestinian militant groups in Gaza was announcing a ceasefire. Um, it is interesting that uh, in their own ways, both sides in this case seemed cautious about not unduly escalating the situation. Um, as you alluded to, uh, on the one hand, there are certain similarities between um, the, the dismal conditions that were just outlined in Gaza, uh, particularly over the last year or so. Uh, unemployment is at an all-time high. The borders remain closed. Electricity levels are at an all-time low. Uh, life is very, very difficult. Uh, this was also true uh, back in 2014 uh, when uh, that summer – um, Hamas, uh, with its back similarly in a corner, um, opted to escalate militarily and, and you know, effectively launch what became a 50-day war against Israel. Um, this time around, despite conditions in Gaza being very bad and, and uh, Hamas itself being in a very difficult situation, um, they were careful not to escalate. And I, I think there are a few things going on here. On the one hand, um, as, as bad as conditions in Gaza have been, there is some progress on the ground thanks to long-running Egyptian and Qatari negotiations. Um, the Qataris have begun to subsidize the 
the salaries of some civil servants in the Hamas-backed government in Gaza. This is the, the $15 million we saw going in. Right, right. So those payments have started. Uh, there are also Qatari funds coming in um, to purchase fuel for the Gaza power plant, which has finally increased the electricity supply somewhat. So while things are very, very difficult, Gaza remains an open-air prison um, thanks to Israeli restrictions, life is a little better. And the Hamas officials I've spoken to in the last couple of days um, emphasized that the public in Gaza does not want a war, and they are hoping uh, that that conditions will further improve. So um, for those reasons, they were very careful uh, not to further escalate the the violence we saw last week. Could you kind of um, switch gears slightly and take a look from the, the Israeli uh, side of things? The, the ceasefire deal uh, prompted the defense minister to resign from the government, citing its kind of weak response to the situation and, and take his party with him. This led to a whole bunch of speculation that Netanyahu might need to call early elections to shore up his government, which has a, a very narrow majority, a one-seat majority in parliament. Um, at this point, Nathan, does it look like Netanyahu's out of the woods on that front or – and kind of more broadly, uh, to what extent are electoral concerns shaping the government's response here? For now, it appears Netanyahu has weathered this crisis. Uh, in the immediate aftermath of the ceasefire agreement, uh, Defense Minister Lieberman resigned in protest. Uh, and then you saw uh, Israeli Education Minister Naftali Bennett threaten – that if he wasn't given the defense portfolio, he too uh, would leave the government, which would have brought about its collapse. Um, Prime Minister Netanyahu delivered a very effective speech uh, on Sunday um, in which he effectively said that only he can steer Israel through this security crisis and that he was placing Israel's security above petty politics. And uh, by yesterday, uh, Education Minister Bennett had done a U-turn and backed down. So this means that the Netanyahu government is now smaller. It has a one-seat majority only, but it's enough. And Prime Minister Netanyahu has said that Israel will not see elections for another year. So the immediate political pressure of an early election uh, appears to have abated, um, which would seem to afford Prime Minister Netanyahu a little more room to manage the situation uh, with Gaza more carefully. And just looking at the kind of Palestinian side of the equation, how much of an impact, uh, Nathan, does the, the infighting between the different factions, namely Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas and the Hamas leadership, have on the kind of overall dynamic here? It's highly problematic. And the biggest difficulty is that it it makes it much harder to envision a political horizon for Gaza in the context of a unified Palestinian state. Um, President Abbas has really been sidelined over the last few months as these negotiations with Qatar and Egypt have gone ahead. They've effectively found ways to work around the Palestinian Authority government for the transfers of funds to Gaza that we've seen. Um, this is, is somewhat unprecedented. And in the longer term, it's hard to see how uh, Gaza and the West Bank could re be reunited in, in some um, unified uh, political body as long as you have this deep fissure between these two major Palestinian parties. Before last week's events, almost a year of negotiations uh, kind of led by the UN and Egypt seemed to be bearing some fruit. Where do those stand now and uh, and how much have they been set back? It's not obvious that they've been set back uh, based on the violence of last week. Uh, the, the challenge is that these agreements, first of all, are not in writing. Uh, all parties concerned describe them as understandings. Uh, and at best, we are only in an initial six-month confidence-building phase. We're in phase one of these understandings, during which time these Qatari funds are supposed to come into Gaza, which helps in the short term. But for these agreements to have legs and, and for conditions in Gaza to really improve, uh, you need to see the second phase of this process roll out. 
Um, and that's where I think um, the work of the UN and the ad hoc liaison committee, that's the, the donor coordinating group for Palestine, that's where their efforts presumably would come in. There are agreements, uh, at least in theory, to f move ahead on a series of long delayed infrastructure projects which should improve uh, water and electricity supplies in Gaza in the longer run. If those agreements go ahead beyond this six month confidence building phase, that will be very positive. Unfortunately, the track record here is not great. Um, Israel in the past has paid lip service to wanting to see these kinds of improvements in Gaza, but when it comes time to import, for example, the you know myriad components you need to build a desalination facility in Gaza, uh, Israel has often raised objections to the import of specific items on security grounds. So for now, I think this process has weathered a, a significant test, but whether or not it can go further is an open question. Great. I think we are uh, just about running out of time, so I'd like to get last thoughts from both of you. Uh, Elizabeth, what's your kind of prognosis looking ahead to 2019, and what are the issues that you'll be paying kind of most attention to over the next few months? Sure. I mean, for us, again, our main focus is on ensuring that we have the requisite resources to keep our schools open. In Gaza, we run 525 schools. Uh, we've achieved gender parity since the 1960s. That means that at least 50% um, of all of our schools are girls, and girls and boys both are able to attend these civilian secular institutions you know, freely. Um, and that, I think, is an incredibly important investment uh, worth protecting, enriching, enhancing, and continuing. And to be very clear, um, there's no alternative to us. There's no other entity currently or in the near term in the next couple of years who would be able to step in and to do that work for us. So that's definitely where our eye will be. Um, and we think that it is probably the most important thing that we can do to ensure um, a, a sort of collectively important effort toward ensuring peace. We believe very strongly in that. Uh, obviously, in addition, it will be finding ways to um, continue to provide um, our 22 health centers with the resources they need to respond to regular patient visits, but also, and this is worth highlighting and emphasizing, the extraordinary number of injured uh, Palestinians, including refugees, including UNRWA students, that have occurred um, since the border clashes starting in late March. It's it's really worth pointing out that more uh, Palestinians have been injured during these last several months than during the entirety um, of the 2014 war. So those figures are now well over 24,000, including um, almost 6,000 with live ammunition. So that has really impacted our ability to provide effective uh, health care services to the population there. And then finally, um, continue to ensure that our food pipeline remains open without challenges. Obviously, we wish we were in a situation where Palestinians were able to provide for their own livelihoods, but until there is a fundamental change in the conditions there, then ensuring that food gets to half the population is a top priority for us. So we, we feel fairly confident that we'll be able to continue to see um, international community donor support for our operations. Our strong sense is that the overwhelming majority of the international community continues to believe strongly um, in UNRWA as um, an institution of stability uh, until, of course, there is some type of long-term process and just solution. Nathan, where more kind of broadly do you see things uh, going from here? Well, in terms of Gaza, uh, it depends on, uh, first of all, if the current calm can be maintained, if we do get... Um, six months of Qatari-funded salaries and fuel for the power plant, that would be very positive. Uh, but then without um, Israeli agreement to allow uh, much-needed work on Gaza's infrastructure, uh, without Israeli agreements to further open Gaza's borders, to allow a more normal movement of people and goods and services, um, it is hard to see Gaza remaining stable in the long term. Uh, another big variable here is what peace plan will the Trump administration put forward, if any? Uh, there is 
talk in the media of late that something is coming soon. Uh, the Palestinian government in Ramallah has already uh, been very clear in rejecting uh, whatever the Trump administration has on offer. Um, if, in fact, the Trump administration cannot find a way to support uh, the traditional U.S. positions that back an independent Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza, um, that could also be destabilizing. Uh, it's certainly going to mean that um, the Trump administration will continue to be sidelined as an actor in this conflict, and, and that by itself is, is something of an historical anomaly. Ever since at least the 1990s, the U.S. has been the key driver uh, in the pursuit uh, of an agreement to this conflict, and the Trump administration, um, because of its recognition of, of Jerusalem as Israel's capital and then whatever it has in the works regarding a peace plan, has really um, pulled itself out of that by by totally sabotaging its own relations with the Palestinians. So that may get worse if the Trump administration cannot come out with a plan that supports minimum Palestinian rights and affords the basis for both Israelis and Palestinians to live in safe and free countries. I think we'll need to leave it there. But Elizabeth, Nathan, thank you both for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to our audience for listening. And thank you to our colleague, Scott Zuki for producing today's program. Happy birthday, Scott. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. And we will see you all next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.